My kids asked me to play a video game with them recently. Notice they didn't ask me because I get nauseous like <laughs> first second that I look at the screen. <laughs> How many of you guys have played or know the game Minecraft? Okay, this is an illustration only for some, uh, or a story only for some. Uh, but Minecraft is this really strange game that I'd seen them play before. It's like these characters made of blocks, like the graphics are just atrocious in the game. And you live in this blocky world and you dig up ground and you can plant gardens or raise cattle. And it's a survival game where you have to build a hut because there's monsters that come out at night or whatever. It's this goofy little game. And... Um, I started playing it, and, and you win awards in this game, right, for, for doing certain things. I recently got the award, um, the oldest person in the world playing Minecraft right now, right? Um, so, uh, so at any rate, there, it's a hard game to learn at first because the navigation is like longitude, latitude, but it doesn't work the proper way it does in the world. And so it takes some time, and you're running around totally lost trying to figure out where to go and what to do, and there might be monsters chasing you. In that moment, it's a confusing game to learn and to start. However, uh, we've learned to navigate it a little bit better, and we're going to hold together as a family in spite of all the yelling and frustration. Why did you turn that direction? Go the other way, right? So I've been, I've been thinking about that this week. Uh, we, we're in a series in Moses, and we're at the point in the story um, where they are going to leave Egypt. Pharaoh's going to drive them out, and we'll go through all that in a few minutes. Uh, but the next step, how will we begin to navigate? Where are we now? Where are we headed? Who will, who will lead us? Who will guide us? Are the questions Israel's asking as they head out into the desert. So today we're going to look at the story of the actual exodus as the, the Israelites leave Egypt. But it's important to look at this section of the story in context, because if you just tell a little bit of the story without knowing the background, it really changes how we view and interpret that story. And so here's a little bit of the background. God makes a covenant with a man named Abraham and then his, his sons, um, Isaac and Jacob. And God's covenant with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that I will bless you so that you will be a blessing for all the nations. That I will work through you. You will be my people so that the whole world will know who I am. And if you've read Genesis, you know that um, Jacob has a bunch of kiddos and their brothers um, sell Joseph into slavery. And so Joseph, this, this huge dramatic traumatic event happens to him and he goes off to Egypt as a slave. But God uses that, even though that was not a good thing, obviously, for his brothers to do. God uses that and brings good out of that. And Joseph prospers in Egypt. And God ends up using that to save the rest of the family. There's a giant famine, and they don't have any food, and Joseph is in charge of all the stores of food. And so they end up bringing the whole family to Egypt, and it's a good thing, and they prosper there. Eventually, the leadership changes, and the Pharaoh um, is fearful and mistrusting of the Israelites. And so he oppresses them, and they become slaves. And they're slaves in Egypt for over 400 years, a really long time. And yet God does not forget about his covenant with the Israelites and he plans this dramatic rescue. I will come and I will deliver you out of Egypt. And he calls Moses in the burning bush. And Moses like, I don't know if I want that job. Um, but eventually Moses agrees and he goes and he's the leader. After months of, of Moses and Aaron approaching Pharaoh and God performing all these, these miraculous plagues to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, Pharaoh finally agrees, I will let the people go. Um, and God demonstrates his power over all the gods of Egypt. So in Exodus chapter 12, late in the night, Pharaoh calls Moses and he says, go. Get out of this land. Everything you've requested, you can have. Take all your livestock and all your people and go. Uh, the people of Egypt are saying to themselves, to each other, uh, let them go. Hurry out of this country because otherwise we will all die. They are terrified. After this 10th plague, uh, they are done with the Israelite people. 
And so they send them away. And the Israelites, the text says, they plunder the Egyptians as they leave Egypt, which I don't know if, if you're like me, you hear the word plunder and you think like pirates, right? Uh, but it was nothing like that. Uh, God turned the hearts of the Egyptians and the Israelites said to them, give us all your gold and silver. And they must ask nicely. They had to have said please because the Egyptians give them all their gold and silver. And so Israel, slaves, a slave nation, leaves Egypt incredibly numerous and incredibly wealthy. Isn't that like God? <laughs> the contrast there is it still amazes me. But God, as God leads them out of Egypt, he doesn't lead them through um, on the most direct route. Because the most direct route out of Egypt would take them through the Philistine territory. And God says that if they have to, to go to battle in a hostile territory, he, he thought that they might turn back and go back to Egypt. And so instead, God leads them on this roundabout desert road towards the Red Sea. And that's where we start off today. Exodus 13, verse 20, after they lit... They, after leaving Sukkoth, uh, they camped at Etham at the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Can you imagine that scene? I have a hard time imagining it, but I want, I want to know what that was like here you have this this enormous mass of people um, all the Israelites and for generations all they've ever known is the brutality of slavery and finally they're they're allowed to leave finally they are free and and so imagine all the emotions that they must be feeling the relief the joy, the, the uncertainty, the confusion, like the wondering, what's this going to be like? And then they look down the road for the first time, this, this unknown road that they're about to journey on, and they see a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I really want to know what, what it looked like. I, I, I want to, to see that. What I love about this pillar is that it's a clear sign of God's leadership. God's saying to the Israelites, hey, I have done this. I have delivered you out of Egypt, and I am with you, and I will lead you. All you need to do is follow me. And here's a clear sign, a visible sign of my leadership. And so as we get into Exodus chapter 14, God speaks to Moses and he says, I know I had you travel in, the, in this direction to begin, but now I want you to circle back and I want you to corner yourself against the Red Sea, okay? And, um, and uh, I can only imagine Moses in this moment. Let's move as far and as fast as we can directly away from Egypt. But God says, I have a different plan. Uh, he says, Pharaoh will think that you're wandering lost in the desert and, and that you're hemmed in. And I will harden his heart. We spoke about that last couple of weeks. And he will pursue you. And I will gain glory for myself through his army. The story continues in chapter 14, verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots with all the other chariots in Egypt with officers over them. Oh, Pharaoh, after 10 plagues and finally letting the people go, we would think he would have learned his lesson at this point. And yet, uh, he is repeating a pattern that we saw throughout the previous chapters, throughout the plagues. Uh, when things got difficult, when a severe plague was on them, they turned to God. He even admits his sin against God at times. And then as soon as a plague is lifted, he has a change of heart. And he decides, nope, I, I, I can't let them go. And so in this moment, uh, Pharaoh plays that pattern out again in his life. He realizes, oh my goodness, what have we done? Uh, I, uh, the nation must have been built on the slave labor of 
couple million Israelite people that have now left. And so he rallies a massive army. I was looking at some historical stuff this week, and um, a, a, a chariots, um, platoon would often be five chariots. He musters 600 of them to chase down the Israelite people uh, and uh, and to uh, bring them back to Egypt. In verse 10, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, uh, as, as he approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So they look up and here's this massive army coming to them. And as you can imagine, they're terrified. I mean, these people had just left Egypt. They still bear the scars of slavery. They've experienced oppression at the hands of the Egyptians. They know what angry Egyptian soldiers are like. They know that. They've experienced that. And so the first thing they do is they cry out to God. And I love, I love that this first reaction. They cry out to God. So on one hand, they've seen what God can do, right? They've seen how miraculously he's worked to bring them out of Egypt. They've seen what he's capable of in, in terms of the plagues and those signs and wonders. So they've seen the miraculous ways that God can save them. On the other hand, they've experienced slavery their whole life. They've experienced the evil um, the pain, the suffering of slavery. And it's interesting that they, for me, as, as to think about this moment, they have to hold these two realities simultaneously. They've seen the suffering and evil, and also they've seen the goodness of God. And obviously today we, we have different circumstances, but I've, I've been in that place, and I wonder if you can think of a time when things are challenging because it's like you see see what's wrong, you see the evil, you feel the pain, but also there's, there's the goodness of God and God working out good. And those times in life are really complex as we hold those two realities. And so it's so hard for the Israelites to trust and to stay calm in this moment. So what do they do? They turn on Moses. And they say, Moses, you've destroyed us. Like, we, we, were, we are sure we're about to die in the desert. And as horrible as slavery was, it, it's better than what we're facing now. And so Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will never you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still. The Israelites pinned in against the sea with a massive army bearing down upon them. And God says through Moses, Moses says, don't be afraid, stand firm, stay right where you are and watch and see what God will accomplish in this moment. There's a little bit of poetic liberty, liberty taken in, in the interpretation here, but it's a beautiful phrase. Um, you need only to be still. A fascinating conclusion or challenge to a people in life or death situations he says just wait just trust just be still it's a powerful moment to be told to be still to stay there with that army coming at you and it's interesting to to look on this story and see how there are times when god calls the israelites to take action and there are times when God calls the Israelites to be still or to stay put and watch. So right before last week, we talked about the Passover. And before the 10th plague, God had told the Israelites, hey, I want you to pack up, get ready, get, take care of the food. Here's how I want you to prepare it. Here's what I want you to do. In fact, as you're eating, I want you to have your bag packed and stand up and have your coat on and be ready to walk out the door. Like he, he's telling them it's time for action even before I've accomplished what I'm about to do. And then here, he says, stay put, stay, be still. And, and I think this is really a significant part because in our lives, 
There are times when God calls us to do something that we're really uncomfortable with or that we're not sure about. And, and, and God calls us to step out in faith. And there are other times in our life when God says, okay, I want you to wait and watch and, and just see what I do. And sometimes it's really hard when you, when you hear that call to act, but sometimes it's just as hard when you hear the call to wait and be patient and, and to be still. As followers of Jesus, one of the primary things that we get to do is we are invited to seek God's will, to seek God's calling. For us as individuals, for us as a community, we're invited to listen and, and ask, Spirit, where do you want me to be right now? Do you want me to go? Do you want me to do something? Do you want me to wait? Do you want me... Like, there's so many different possibilities. And we are, as a people, are invited to seek God's um, guidance and to lean into the leading of the Spirit and to listen together in community. And so the climactic moment, verse 15, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after you. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with, the, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. As with the plagues, God says, uh, I am going to bring this to fruition. Like I am going to bring this to a climactic end. For a couple of reasons. First of all, there are consequences for the oppression, the genocide, the enslavement of his people uh, for Egypt. And uh, God is going to make known his name throughout the world as he demonstrates his authority and his power over all the other gods that all the other nations would, uh, that all the other nations worship. And so as he says here, I will gain glory through those attempting to harm my people. Uh, truly, it has come to be. 3,000 years later, some 3,000 years later, we sit here and we explore this text and this story of how God worked powerfully. Uh, God demonstrates in this his power and his faithfulness to his covenant people. This miraculous battle demonstrates to all of us who God is. Now, thousands of years later, we, we recognize the truth in this statement. I will make known my name. I will gain glory through this moment as we remember it today. And we tell the story of what God did on this day. The angel of God that had been in front of the Israelites moves to the back. And the pillar of cloud that had been leading them stands, moves to the back as well and stands in between the Egyptian army and the Israelites. And so there's this visible like barrier that is clearly miraculous in between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And, and night falls and this pillar of cloud brings darkness on one side and light on the other so that the Israelites can see what God is calling them to do. And I love how this is all in the midst of the Israelites' fright and panic. God, God is so faithful in this moment to the Israelites. Over and over, 
God reveals himself to them and says, this is who I am, and I have promised to take care of you, and I'm going to do this. You know, in my, in my journey, in my spiritual walk, there's a, there's a phrase that, that God brings to mind over and over and, and has for years. And, and I may have even talked about this before. But, but the phrase is, even in this, even in this, and, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but for me, in, in my walk with God, there are times I go through something that, that is either scary or painful or hard, and God just shows up, and God is faithful, and God is pr- present, and he provides, and I'm like, thank you, God, that you are here in this. And then life happens, and something else comes up. And for whatever reason, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about this, though. What about this God? Like, and, and God over and over says, even in this, I am faithful. I am present. I am here. And God, this is, this is one of those moments where God shows up. Even in this moment, I will be faithful to you. So this angel and the clouds come in between Israel and Egypt, and the seas part, and they begin to cross the sea. And apparently, this was an all-night event, if I'm reading this correctly, which you can imagine. Uh, the number we're given in Scripture is 600,000 men plus women and children. So I've seen people speculate some 2 million people. I've seen a lot of speculations on how many Israelites are leaving the nation at this moment. But millions of people crossing on dry land as God has parted the seas. The story continues in verse 23. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it uh, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. The Egyptians realized too late that the Lord was fighting for Israel. If you think about human reasoning, it, it would appear that the Egyptians had Israel beat. I mean, they had the bigger army. They had all the, the, the chariots and the weapons. The Israel was, was trapped against the Red Sea. All human reasoning would say that the Egyptians would be victorious, but they hadn't they hadn't realized, they hadn't fully understood that this wasn't just a human battle, that this was a spiritual battle. And throughout this narrative, we've seen how God over and over has said, I will demonstrate my power over the gods of Egypt, including Pharaoh, who was considered one of the gods. The Egyptians realized too late that putting their trust in their military military power and their resources was not enough against the God of Israel. And so none of the army survived. And at the end of the text, we see that not only did Egypt have a realization about God, but Israel did as well. It says they would fear the Lord and trust in him and his servant Moses. Now, the, the term fear the Lord we find throughout scripture, and generally it means less being afraid and more an awe and reverence towards God. But in this moment, I'd imagine there's a healthy dose of actual fear as well. 
right? After all that they've seen between the plagues and the fear that is uh, residing in them still from that moment that they're pinned in and an army is approaching, they cross the sea, they see the army wiped out, and they realize God's power. And in awe and reverence, they say, the text says, they will trust in God and in Moses. Now, trust is interesting because you remember the pattern of Pharaoh throughout the plagues is, I'll turn to God when things are really hard, but then when they relent, I'll go back to my own ways and living in my own way. Israel will play out a similar pattern. They will trust in God a lot of the time, but then circumstances will arise in which their eyes will be diverted to other gods or other things, and there will be consequences for it. But in this moment, we know for sure, uh, they recognize who God is, and they trust in him. They fear him. And they put their trust in him and in Moses. This is quite quite the moment, quite, quite the story in the history of the Israelite people. And that's our story for today. That's the passage that we're looking at. You know, we're in this series and, and we called it Moses. Like the series name is about Moses. We want to look at the character of Moses um, and his faith in God. But in reality, we have to understand that as we read scripture, the main character is God. And we see that here. God is, is the main character and God wants to save his people. And that is true in this story and that is true today. God is the power behind this incredible exodus, this salvation. Now, God is the main character. God is the one God is a driving force. God is the one doing all the miracles. And also, God is choosing to work through Moses. And this is just such a fascinating concept for me because it tells us a lot about God. God asks Moses to raise his hand, his staff over the waters, to part the waters. Now, Moses raising his his hand or staff isn't going to do anything, but God is working through Moses. And so the water parts. It demonstrates something really important to us about God's character, that God desires and chooses to work through humans, that God wants to work through people as as broken and imperfect as we are. God wants to work through, in this story, Moses, and through us today. Yeah, absolutely. We, the church in Scripture, are called a chosen, uh, ch- a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Right throughout Scripture, we read of us being adopted into the story of God and all that He's doing in this world. In, in the text today, we see God accomplishing the impossible, and I believe the same is true today. God desires to, in partnership with us, the church, and I just, I don't, I don't mean just us here, churches throughout the Tri Cities and our nation and the world. God is desiring through His church to partner with us in accomplishing the impossible. God desires to bring healing and wholeness in this world, and He invites us into the story of bringing healing and wholeness in the lives of the people that we will encounter. God desires for there to be peace and love where currently there is hate, and we are invited into this impossible task that God is accomplishing of bringing about peace, love, and healing. God is inviting people to himself, that they would walk with him, know him, and we again are invited to be witnesses in this world, inviting people to know the goodness and the love of the God that created them. And so the question is, will we, like the Israelites, choose fear or trust in God? Just last night, it was ironic, I was awake during the night, just anxiety creeping in and my mind going all these places that it wasn't going to be productive or helpful to go, but I'm stuck in that loop. You've probably experienced that. You see, we don't, I don't face an army in this moment. There's nothing threatening my life. However, there are plenty of aspects of my life in which I get to choose. And last night I'm asking myself, will I choose to trust in God in this moment? Will I trust in God? And the reality is, as we find through Scripture, and many of us have experienced in our day-to-day lives, there is a spiritual battle being waged around us. And so again, we, followers of Jesus, are invited to consider, will we trust in God? The forces against us seem immense and impossible, but God has demonstrated time and time again His faithfulness and His power. The question is, will we trust in God?
And for some of us here today, this might be the first time that question has been posed to you. Will you trust in God? And if you would like to put your faith in him, say, God, I I trust in you, Jesus. I trust in your way and I desire to follow you. You are invited to let us know and we'd, we'd love to celebrate with you and walk with you as you take those next steps in your faith journey. And for many of us here today, we've been following Jesus for a long time in our lives and trying to walk in the way of Jesus. But the question is relevant to us as well. Will we place our trust in God who is faithful, in God who is loving, who God, in a God who lives up to his covenant with his people? Will we place our trust in him? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. A God of love, a God of faithfulness, a God of invitation, a God who invites us to partner with you to heal and restore uh, our community, our families. Lord, we thank you for the good work that you are doing. And so, God, today, as, as individuals, as a community, we're, we're, we're probably all over the place. <laughs> but, Lord, today, I pray that you would show us what it looks like to take the next step of trust and to put our faith in you just a little bit more and to open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit bringing about in us good works and healing and restoration. And so, Lord, we say yes to you and we ask you to teach us (laughs) what it looks like to follow you and to bring us back when we, when we get distracted, to bring us back, Lord. Whatever that pillar of cloud or fire looked like, Lord, I pray for, for, for signs and ways for you to bring us back and say, hey, this is the way I want you to go. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.